This is a real honor. I have to say, when I look across this room, to be able to be on a stage and be in a room with so many innovators, with so many expert learners, and who are, at your heart, world changers. Because if you're an educator, that's what you're doing. So it's a real honor for me to be here with you. And one of the things that um, I want to start talking about with you by, uh, this morning is the real reason that we're all here, which is to make education work for all learners. And if that is the, the real mission of the work that we do, then it's really important for us to reflect on the way that we design our learning environments, to reflect on our practices, but to also reflect on the values that drive those practices. So maybe you've seen a meme like this before. <laughs> maybe it feels true for you. If you know me, um, I've, I've, or even if you don't know me, I'll tell you, I've always been somebody who felt like I'm um, aware of who I am, that I'm pretty convicted and unapologetic about it. And so even though sometimes I, you know, I really feel that way about myself from time to time, I find myself saying or doing things that make me have this reaction, that make me wonder, who are you? What are you saying? So let me give you an example. I have two little boys. We live in an old kind of historic home. And my boys love to fight with each other, as boys do. At least my boys do. And one of the things um, that I always know, I always know that it's time for me to go and intervene when the chandeliers in that old house start to shimmy a little bit. <laughs> and they were, they were dancing last week. And so the, yeah, the, the chandeliers, that is, not my boys. My boys were wrestling. The chandeliers were dancing. So I went upstairs because it was definitely time for me to intervene and, and kind of talk to them about what, what they were doing. And I found myself saying to them when I got to the room where they were, and they turned and looked at me because I was, you know, I caught, caught them doing what they were doing. And I said, you know, when I was a kid, if I was doing what the two of you are doing, my parents would have, and then I'll let you fill in the blank with whatever you think my parents would have done, or whatever your parents would have done. And my boys gave each other the side eye and like sort of snickered about it. And we settled the argument. And as I walked back down the stairs, I thought, yeah, why did you say that? That was such a weird thing to say. And you know why they laughed at you. And here's why. Because when you live and breathe UDL, you inadvertently make all the people around you live and breathe it. <laughs> so I'm actually raising like two little UDL experts <laughs> and they, they catch me from time to time and that's what that side eye and that snicker was all about. That, that comment that I had made to them actually ignored the idea of variability, that people are different. My boys and I as a child are not the same people. And context, right? different time, different place. And um, so I thought to myself, yeah, they're right. That thing I said was kind of laughable. Laughable because it ignored everything that I live and breathe every day and everything that they hear me talk about all the time. And so the reason I'm relating this story to you, and my husband always says, you're gonna turn this into UDL, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> I turn everything into UDL. It's so easy. But as I've looked around, um, as, I, as I've worked throughout the country, and as I've done a lot of work with teachers in my home state, I'm a UDL facilitator, so I work shoulder to shoulder with teachers to deepen their knowledge and their implementation and their dedication to making education work for all students. And so as I've been working with teachers on their journeys, I find this little meme to be true from time to time. That people who are on their journey for UDL and who feel convicted in what they're doing. From time to time, they open their mouth or they go over to the copy machine and something like this comes out. So why is that? A couple of reasons. When we know better, but still do something that we know is not exactly the right thing, there are a few things that drive that. So I'm going to start by talking about culture, because culture drives everything that we do. 
What we say, what we don't say, the way we behave, the behavior we accept from other people, and right down to the way that we, that we compete with other people, collaborate with other people, hold grudges, forgive, culture drives much of that. Culture paints the large brush strokes for the way that we see the world. And for a lot of us, this environment that you see here is a big part of that culture. It's a big part of the culture that we grew up in that contributed to our conceptions of what education is. But there's something more than that. So if culture paints those large brush strokes for the way that we see the world, our funds of knowledge, meaning our specialized skills that come from our experiences and our specialized um, pieces of knowledge that come from our own life experiences, those funds of knowledge paint those smaller, finer brush strokes for how we see the world. And so culture and funds of knowledge come together to help us form our cultural conceptions for all of these various things in the world, including education. And so as designers and as people who are dedicated to that mission of making education work for all students, we have to acknowledge that this, this thing you see here, this traditional paradigm, this rigid environment that many of us were educated in, it is part of our cultural conceptions of education. And so even when we know better, even when our habits and our practices change and our conversations change, those beliefs are pretty deep-rooted and they take a lot more time, awareness, and reflection to change, which is why sometimes we open up our UDL rockstar mouths and something like the, you know, this traditional paradigm sort of slips out. So if you think about the first time that you heard about UDL, you probably experienced some pretty significant cognitive dissonance. Raise your hand if you felt like your mind was blown the first time that somebody talked to you about this. Yeah, I'm still having my mind blown. Because even though you believe the things that you hear, you believe the research, and I'll be honest with you, I work in a district where the data is undeniable and the teacher and student narratives are undeniable. And yet, from time to time, I see other people, and even I myself, have that cognitive dissonance that comes from those old beliefs about education creeping up. And so you guys probably have experienced this. Think about the very first time that you found out that engagement was actually your job. <laughs> what? I mean, I came from a place where people say, um, I mean, I came from, you know, throughout my education, I heard, through my career, I've heard people say, those kids just need to get engaged. Those kids are not engaged and they need to get engaged. And then when you learn that, oh, that's my job. As the designer, the instructor, the person in charge of the learning environment, I am supposed to engage my learners. And so even when you know that, you might still entertain those conversations about kids need to get engaged, even though you know better, right? Your practices and your habits begin to change, but those beliefs are so deep-rooted that they take a little bit longer to change. So you have to be aware of those beliefs, and you have to be aware of those pitfalls. What lures us back to those old ways of thinking? And the truth is, it's always well-intentioned. What, we usually, what usually lures us back into those old ways of thinking is comfort and familiarity. So as I've worked across the country and in my own home state, and as I've reflected on my own work, these are a handful of the pitfalls that I see us having to be aware of. And some of these might resonate with you, and my guess is you have a few of your own that you could add to this list. So I wanna talk about these. One of the, um, one of the first pitfalls that I see as being a significant um, lure into old ways of thinking is student behavior. That when kids don't behave the way that we want them to behave, it's easy to blame the kid. That's the system that many of us came from, a punitive system that endlessly scrutinizes and, and labels student behavior and then tracks that behavior academically, right? But what we know is that all behavior is communication. And that very often when our students are communicating with us, they're communicating with us about needs that have not yet been met. 
barriers that have not yet been removed. And so we have to stay true to those UDL practices and true to that vision of proactively removing barriers and knowing that I might not think of all of them. And seeing student behavior as communication is really key. And instead of thinking about what is somebody doing wrong, really thinking about what need isn't being met. What barrier has not yet been removed? The next one is standardized testing. Tis the season. My fourth grader is taking those tests even as I'm speaking to you now. Lots of states are engaged in it. So the emphasis that's placed on standardized testing can be pretty consuming. And if you're a classroom practitioner, you probably feel lured and pressured to teach kids how to take that test, to interrupt learning, to teach kids how to take a test. And no matter where I go, and no matter what the, the focus of professional learning is, I will always have somebody, usually more than one somebody, come to me and say, tell me how UDL is gonna help my kids pass that test. And to that I say, that's not the goal of UDL. And in fact, that's not the goal of education. And if we make that the goal of education, that's a pretty low expectation. And universal design for learning is not about low expectations. It's about keeping the bar high for all of our learners and lowering the barriers. It's about rigor and challenge. Teaching to a test and even preparing kids for that test, spending hours and days out of your class time to do that is miserable and cumbersome. But miserable and cumbersome are not synonymous with challenging and rigorous. Because at the end of miserable and cumbersome, there is no joy. At the end of challenge and rigor, there is joy in learning. And that is what we have to keep in mind as we have students in front of them, that learning should be joyful. Packets and other educational ephemera. This is the, the, the junk that's lurking in your old filing cabinets and in your old computer files. Here's the problem with packets. They are produced and created and designed by people who are not busy revolutionizing education in the way that you are. They are produced and designed by people who are busy revolutionizing their bank accounts. They are the same people who sell those tests to our states, oftentimes. And we frequently go back to those, those resources because, again, they're comfortable. Right? They're familiar. And my kids have seen them before, and I've used them before, and, and we, we've all gotten through it. But again, the problem with those is that they are designed for average. They're designed for average. And I know a lot of you stood up when Brian said, how many of you want to design to the edges? I know a lot of you stood up. So that's one reason that we have to abandon those. It's one reason that we must abandon packets and these other inaccessible resources that feel so comfortable and so familiar. And lastly, shiny new things. One of the things I love most about UDL is that it does not ask us to throw out meaningful professional learning. Instead, it helps us make sense of it, to use it more proactively, to use it more intentionally, and to really think about Will this remove barriers for my students? And if it doesn't, maybe it's really not that meaningful. So that's one of the things that I really love about Universal Design for Learning, is that it makes us take our professional learning and not abandon it, but to use it. So as you go out there and you seek new professional learning, new strategies, and new resources, one of the things that I have to caution you about is that also those strategies and resources frequently cannot be implemented as is. Because as is typically means designed for average. And that is not our gig. That is not what we do. That's not who we are. We know that we can take those strategies and use our UDL powers to take those strategies to the margins. And so that is something that we must charge ourselves and our colleagues with. 
that there's great professional learning out there, there's great resources out there. But if you implement them as is, you are perpetuating the myth of average instead of fighting against it. So we have to design to the edges. And we have to keep that in mind as we take on new learning. You can probably add a couple of your own to this list, right? I mean, these are just a handful of those that I see as being notorious pitfalls as we work hard to stay true to UDL and make education work for all learners. So in addition to knowing those pitfalls, we have to stay true to our practices. And this framework represents our practices. This is what we do. These principles, these guidelines, and all of those various checkpoints, this is what we do to proactively remove barriers for all learners in every learning environment. But we also talk about this framework being greater than the sum of its parts. More than three principles, more than nine guidelines. And what does that mean? There's a value system that drives UDL implementation. And as I see it, that value system comes in three parts. Number one, that school can and should work for all kids, and you have the power to make it so. You all have the power to make it so. By being a reflective practitioner, by seeking professional learning, designing to the edges, so that all kids have an opportunity for rigorous and challenging learning experiences. The second one, that every single learner deserves high expectations and rigor, not just the ones who come to school ready to learn. Those are the easy ones. Every kid of every color, socioeconomic status, every ability level, in every region, in every city, deserves access to challenging and rigorous learning experiences. And lastly, that each of us is tasked with relentlessly pursuing the banishment of the myth of average by designing to the edges, because we know it's crystal clear, the research is crystal clear, that when we design for our learners with the greatest need, everyone benefits from that design. So our work is thriving, but we have more work to do. A lot of people in here stood up when Brian asked who was here for the first time. So our work is thriving, but we, had a lot of, we have a lot of work to do. And the world is changing. And as humans, from time to time, we'll complain about that. We'll say things like kids these days, and you'll hear other people say, you know, teaching isn't what it was five years ago or 10 years ago or even last year. And to that I would say, show me a profession that has not changed in the last year or five years or 10 years. And in fact, I would argue, if you're in a profession that isn't changing, you're in a profession that is failing. And that is not what teaching is. We're a thriving profession. That is not what UDL is. We are a thriving movement, a revolution in education. And so as the world continues to change, whether or not you know it, you are the transition team. As the world changes, it will continue to demand one thing, expert learners people who can live and thrive in a world that does change. So know your pitfalls, stay true to your practices, reflect on the beliefs that drive those practices, design to the edges, and relentlessly pursue the banishment of that myth of average. The world is changing and you are the transition team. Enjoy the summit today, thank you so much.